the earthquake occurred a little bit before 2 p.m. local time uh, on a Tuesday. It was, uh, for me, that was the second day of classes, the beginning of the semester, so it made things really fun. Uh, magnitude 5.8, and it was occurred about halfway between Richmond and Charlottesville. It was just barely off of I-64. If I remember correctly, it's about uh, six or eight kilometers off of I-64, so it's not very far at all. Um, it occurred in a fault that is a reverse fault, uh, and what happens in an earthquake is that a fault is under a lot of stress, and yet it's also got friction on it. And suddenly the stress exceeds the friction and it slips suddenly. And locally you have fault slip. That sudden slip occurs really suddenly, creates a sound wave or a seismic wave in the ground that then spreads outwards from the epicenter. And here we have a map of where that, earth, if that earthquake in central Virginia at a minute later and two minutes later. And basically what's happening is the disturbance, like the drop of in, in, in a pond, the disturbance only occurs at one place. But the vibrations from that disturbance, the shaking, in this case, in the case of the earthquake, occurs, uh, uh, spreads, uh, spreads outwards in a wave away from the source. So the earthquake is sort of two things. The earthquake is sudden slip and a fault. In this case, the fault was about eight kilometers by about four kilometers. But the second part of the earthquake is when that thing slips suddenly, it creates a shaking in the ground, and that shaking is felt a long way away. So it's spread outwards from the source. And we record that on seismometers. Seismometers are essentially a mass on the spring. So you've got this mass on the spring. As the ground vibrates, the mass kind of sits still. It's inertia. So you see the ground vibrate, the mass kind of sits still, and we can attach a pencil and a, draw it on a piece of paper, or alternatively, we can wrap a coil of wire around it and record it electronically, record the mass. In this case, the mass is a magnet moving up and down, with uh, uh, creating an electronic signal. Um, the stations that were live on the day of the earthquake uh, were these stations shown here in the map. Uh, I think there's two or three that I'm missing, but I got most of them. And the blue ones are run by the U.S. Geologic Survey to monitor earthquakes in the nation. And as you'll notice that there's not a lot of them in Virginia. This one's blue. Turns out this one here is also funded by the U.S. Geologic Survey. The red ones are run by Virginia Tech. And none of those, mumble, mumble, none of those have any funding. So these are volunteer stations and volunteer time to make those happen. But it was a really good thing that they were live on the day of this event because it really helped us to better understand it. And I'm going to show you data from four of those five stations in the next plot. And what we have is each of these plots is a single seismic station. The horizontal axis here is time going from left to right, and this is 20 seconds. And for a single station, the ground moves up and down. We get this vibrating signal as a function of time. And we have stations here in Richmond, Lynchburg, Roanoke, and Blacksburg. So getting progressively farther away from the epicenter. And you can see the waves that have traveled through the interior of the Earth getting farther and farther, later and later in time, because they had to travel farther to get there. And then we can see this really strong shaking. This is the surface wave, which is the slower but stronger shaking that is actually the wave that causes most of the damage. And interestingly, because these seismometers are designed to be really, really sensitive for small earthquakes, the one in Richmond, 55 kilometers from the epicenter, wasn't able to handle the, the strength of the shaking that happened even at that distance. Uh, we can take those same plots further and further away. This, and the plot's rotated 90 degrees from the last one. The horizontal scale here is distance in degrees. A degree is about 60 miles, or about 110 kilometers. This is about 3,300 kilometers away. Now Blacksburg is the closest station, and we go all the way, in this case, to Idaho. And again, you can see the first ground shaking inside the ground, arriving at later and later and later times. So we've got time going up in this case. And then the slower but stronger surface waves arriving at later and later and later times as you go farther away. And I had the same movie that, he's, that he showed you before, that Patrick showed you before. I'm just going to show you it again quickly to point out. Uh, again, the, the red is upward motion, blue is downward motion. Um, you can see the body waves, the waves going through the interior of the Earth, hitting California, and then you can see the surface waves coming out much slower, but much stronger shaking. Uh, excuse me, tripping over a chair here. Uh, going outwards uh, 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 across the country. I'm just going to quickly show it again in, uh, one more time. I wanted to focus on the stronger amplitudes. So here's the body waves, here's the surface waves, very, very strong amplitudes going out across the country, and then eventually arriving in California. <clears throat> The shaking from the earthquake was felt as far away as Canada in the north, uh, Alabama in the south, from the coast to uh, the Midwest. So this is a plot of people who reported on the internet to the USGS that they recorded the shaking and how strong it was using a scale that is descriptive. And the reason, it is actually felt for, for, um, by the USGS, the USGS tells us 
that this earthquake was actually felt by more people than any previous earthquake in, earthquake in the United States. Not because it's the largest earthquake, but because it happened where the population centers are. This is the biggest earthquake in a century on the East Coast. And this is a map the New York Times created this beautiful database, but it's coming from the US, sorry, this beautiful image, but it's coming from the, whoa, I can't quite see. There's supposed to be a map of the United States in behind there. <clears throat> Shows up nicely on my screen. Um, <laughs> it's got a little bit too bright, I guess. Uh, what they've done is they've randomly drawn dots, uh, grabbing from the felt reports. The people who reported I felt the shaking on the internet and randomly drew the dots from 12,000-odd, from, uh, 12,000, 12, 13,000-odd 12, reports as to where they occurred. And you can see that even though these two quakes were very, very similar in size, a 5.8 in Virginia and a 6.0 in uh, California, for those of you who know that was the Park Parkfield earthquake in 2004, you can see that there was felt for a lot longer distance here uh, in the East Coast. And the reason for that is the different rocks that these waves are traveling through. So the amount of energy that was released is very similar, but the rocks are very different. The rocks on the West Coast are softer and more absorbing as the waves go through them. The rocks in the East are harder and absorb less. So this is kind of anal 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 analogous to sound on a foggy day versus sound on a crystal clear day, where the sound on a crystal clear day will propagate, will spread out a lot farther distance before you can't hear it. So same idea going on here. Um, most of the, da uh, the damage, of course, was worse in Louisa County, where the earthquake occurred. Uh, got pictures of a found building foundation that's actually been destroyed here, broken windows, uh, chimneys that fell down, which is, of course, one of the dominant types of damage locally, brick facing or brick decorative structures. This is the school in Louisa County. Uh, here we have an entire wall, a brick facing wall that was non-structural fall down. And here we see more structural damage on a brick wall in this case. So, what do you do when you have an earthquake, you ask the East Coasters. And if you watch the news, what everybody did was ran outside. Number one place you don't want to be standing during an earthquake is right beside a building, which is where you have to go to get out the door. So do not run outside in an earthquake. The West Coasters all know this. The East Coasters do not. And I was going to NSF and USGS headquarters, and that's what they were telling us. These are geoscientists, and that's what they were telling us they did during the earthquake was run outside. Do not run outside <laughs> during an earthquake. So there's a lot of damage in Louisa County. I hear recently we just got some uh, disaster relief, just got funded fairly recently for that. About $40 million got funded. Uh, there was damage felt as far away as Washington and uh, um, Baltimore. Um, probably one of the more famous ones is the Washington Monument that is still closed today and probably will be closed for some substantial time. There were cracks that were visible on the outside of the monument. There are also places where there's substantial daylight showing through what used to be a nice solid place. And there's several of these bricks that have actually moved a little bit in the upper part of the National Monument. It wasn't designed for the shaking, but you can also imagine shaking the bottom of this thing, what's going to happen to the top. So it's actually a really not an ideal structure in terms of its shape, made of these relatively rigid materials, uh, big, big blocks of rock you can understand why it took a fairly serious damage. But we don't actually know the rocks underneath that as to how that might have played a role in uh, uh, amplifying or not the shaking that occurred. And of course, the other place that took probably the worst damage was the National Cathedral. Uh, here's a picture of the spires after the earthquake. And if you look closely at these spires, they aren't quite as vertical as they used to be. And here's a zoom in on one of them. It's missing its top. And you can see substantial motion of the tops of these spires. There's objects that have fallen all through this. And I just scanned through their own website as to some of the damage that occurred. It's really substantial. This is a 20th century building. There's no excuse for this. This was not designed to withstand even a modest shaking during an earthquake. Okay? So this is, took some pretty serious damage. Of course, most interest to us was that there's a nuclear power plant only 22 kilometers away from the epicenter, the North Anna nuclear power plant run by Dominion Power. Um, the bad news is it shook substantially. It shook twice the shaking that it was designed to withstand. So it shook twice as hard at, at several frequencies that it was designed to withstand. The good news was it shut down very cleanly, actually absolutely according to protocol. There was an inspection. There's no structural damage to the reactor in any way. Lots of non-structural damage like this was occurring within the plant, but nothing structural occurred uh, at the plant. Now, there was issues with power systems and these sorts of things, but the actual backup power worked properly to shut the thing down, and it was actually restarted. I believe it was late November. Is that correct? Yeah, late November that it actually restarted its work. So the good news was that it did not have a disaster, but if you look at the design spec, 
This could have been a very, very, very scary occurrence about 100 kilometers upwind from Washington. The other fun thing is that they store nuclear waste on site, like most of our nuclear power plants do in the United States. And these are uh, dry cask storage uh, uh, on site. I believe these are eight foot tall fences for scale. And if you look at the base of these casks, you can actually see that they wobbled and moved several inches during the, the earthquake. Now these things are solid enough to tip over and bang and roll and not break, but it's interesting to see just the types of motions that must have occurred for this to have moved these large casks. They're pretty heavy. So why do we have earthquakes in Virginia? We're a heck of a lot way, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. How far was that nuclear plant from the earthquake? 22 kilometers. It was just, um, I don't know the numbers at the top of my head. Um, the, the quantified shaking here was, it was, I believe it was supposed to be about a magnitude of five at a larger distance than this. This was a 5.8, <laughs> almost next door, 22 kilometers away. And and I, magnitude greater than what it was designed to withstand. In terms of quantified shaking, it's a yeah. factor of two yes. is what it was. Literally, if, so, so in terms of the amplitude of ground displacement, yeah. it's a factor of two more than it was designed to withstand. This may have been the usual engineering rule of thumb of multiplied by two whenever you have a design spec, but that saved us in this case. The other possibility is that there was a retrofit in the 1990s, so the, the original design spec was in the early 70s, I believe it opened in 71, is something like that. In the 1990s, there was a retrofit for seismic, and that may have also played a role in how it withstood the shaking. According to the news reports, it said Dominion claims it was designed for an earthquake of up to 6.2, but the NRC uses ground motion. You know, not, not yeah, there's, the is if you read the early 70s report, there's no chance of having an earthquake in this area, and I'll show you a slide that shows the exact opposite. So, <laughs> <laughs> published before there was the, the plant was built. So, yeah, there's, there was some uh, willful ignorance. The, the, the other side of the equation, though, was in the late 60s and 70s, we really weren't studying earthquakes in the East Coast at all. So uh, the amount of information out there was pretty minimal at the time. There were no seismic networks, for example. So we're a long way from the plate boundaries. In fact, we're pretty well close to the middle of the North American plate. The plate boundaries in the West Coast or in the middle of the Atlantic or in the Caribbean, we're a long way away. So why are we having earthquakes in the middle of the plate? And the reason is, uh, sorry, and, and the answer is that while well, we know we do have earthquakes, this is the National Earthquake Hazard Map. I think I actually have the outdated version of it. The new version looks pretty similar. And the red colors are where they're supposed to be, on the plate boundary, the highest hazards are on the plate boundary. But you see we have some substantial hazards on the map in the East Coast, including in Central Virginia. And what these things are showing is places where we know we have earthquakes or have had earthquakes in the past. So these dots are showing us where we think we either have a lot of little earthquakes, which suggests maybe we can have a big one, or alternatively we know about a big one in the past, such as Charleston and New Madrid. But this map is showing us where we've had them, and it may actually be the gaps in between these, because the repeat intervals are thousands, even tens of thousands of years, and we've only got a couple of hundred years of, of history. In fact, some of the biggest hazards may be in places we don't know about today. We just simply don't know the answer to that. But we do have earthquakes in the east. This is a plot that shows um, from that uh, passive-aggressive paper uh, that compiles earthquakes up and down the east coast all the way up to northern Canada and, and uh, Greenland. And on here is magnitude 7.4, magnitude 6.4, magnitude 7.2, so about 6, 5.8, about 7. We do have magnitude sixes and sevens up and down the East Coast. These are not unheard of in history in the East Coast. And here in Virginia, we've had seismic networks here, largely sponsored by the uh, nuclear uh, building of nuclear power plants in the 70s. So since the 70s, we've had uh, um, seismic networks. And this shows since the 70s where the earthquakes have been. And they're centered in Giles County, not far, far from Blacksburg, in the East Tennessee seismic zone, the northernmost end of the East Tennessee seismic zone, which I believe a couple of you live in. And here in central Virginia between Richmond, Charlottesville, and Lynchburg. It's well known to have earthquakes, and sure enough, that's where last August's event occurred. In fact, there was a paper published. The research was done before the plant was completed, and the earthquake occurred in 1875, and our understanding is it's about a magnitude five, and this plot shows from that paper, shows the uh, intensity of the shaking. Intensity is a qual qual qualitative 
measurement of shaking. And this plot shows that same intensity for a more recent event. And the patterns aren't too dissimilar. They're actually very similar events. This one's a little bit further to the southeast, closer to Richmond. Um, but we're seeing a pattern that's not too dissimilar. We've had earthquakes here before, magnitude 5 even, which, by the way, would, would have been pretty close to the design spec of this earthquake. Sorry, the design spec of the uh, North Anna power plant.